Hi, AFI Movie Club, and happy MLK Day. I'm David Oyelowo, and I play Martin Luther King in the film Selma. Through it all, Martin Luther King has spoken of his dream, one which we and many other people around the world share. This scene where Dr. King gets his Nobel Peace Prize was actually the very last scene I shot in the entire movie. It was a very emotional day because uh, playing this role had been a seven year journey for me. I first read the script in 2007. We didn't get to shoot it till 2014. So this being the culmination of those seven years in terms of it being the last scene and also it being this poignant scene where Dr. King gets his Nobel Peace Prize. Now, this scene is a very interesting one to talk about because it wasn't in the original script. Ava DuVernay, who directed the film, actually wrote this scene into the film. It originally started with the scene where Oprah Winfrey goes to try and sign up to be able to vote. But Ava wanted to use the iconic and tragic incident of the four little girls who were bombed in the Birmingham church as the beginning of the film to illustrate how Black people were being terrorized just for their very existence and the fact that racism was callous enough not to just attack people's voting rights, but small children, to murder small children because of the color of their skin. It's just like that. But I study, I know how she do it. See, she parts in the middle, and then... This moment here is a, yeah, a very, very hard moment to watch, but, you know, I think she was absolutely right to do it because it showed that terrorism is not just against your civil rights, it's against your your bodies, against black bodies. There was actually some resistance to her doing this as the first scene. Some of the production team didn't understand that this act of violence bled into voting rights. They felt that it, the film was about voting rights, not terrorism, but this, this illustrated that, that, that terror that black people felt at that time and even still now was pervasive, was violent, and bled into so many facets of Black life. And seeing this image really pulled the audience into the narrative, seeing these broken Black bodies of these young girls. What surprised me and what has continued to stick with me is the fact that what he did, I know I couldn't do. I don't mean just in terms of him being a civil rights leader and him being this sort of iconic figure for Black people. I'm talking about the sheer amount of bravery it took to put not just his life on the line for 13 years, but his family's life on the line. He had a wife and four kids who he knew were being threatened every single day. And the threat of assassination was very close. And I have four children as well. I have a wife I deeply love. And to know that that was a possibility for them and to continue to fight for civil rights would have been a tough thing to do. And I know for a fact, having talked to a lot of people who knew him, having read a lot, that it was a burden he wanted to walk away from severally, but never did. I actually met John Lewis on the set of Selma. I stayed in character for the duration of the shoot and I had put on about 35 pounds. I'd shaved my hairline back. By the time I met him, I was very much in the pocket in terms of playing the role. But I was also very nervous. This was John Lewis. If there was anyone who was going to tell you whether he felt you were evoking his dear friend or not, it would be him. And the first thing he said to me was, hello, Dr. King, it is so nice to see you again. It, of course, stuck with me. It was an incredible kind of vote of confidence and a very moving moment for me as well. Where do we go from here? 
when the film first came out, people would often ask me if there was a need for another Dr. King. And in all honesty, I would stumble because I didn't really know the answer. The thing I did know from all of my study and from playing him is that there was something fundamentally flawed about having a leader like him who could be cut down and who was so prominent that it, it made the movement shutter. There was no one who really came along to take his place. And you could argue that if indeed the movement is larger than the man, that shouldn't happen. And for whatever reason, that did happen. And so even though I didn't have the answer back in 2015, I do think there is something wise and incredibly effective about the fact that the modern day civil rights movement that is Black Lives Matter doesn't have a sort of single figure. And I think that is what makes this movement far more effective. It can be owned by Black, white and brown people. It can be owned across national lines, cultural lines, race lines. And I think that's why we are in a time where we are being able to hold not just Americans, but, you know, leaders and Brits and Russians and Australians and Indians accountable through a movement that is not tied to an individual, but is very much been embraced by all of humanity.